Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening and um, you know dodging the raindrops. I think we're going to be okay. Uh, and then, and then, of course, next Monday is the eclipse. I don't know if you have plans on going anywhere or you're going to think, nah, I think I'm just going to head up, stay home and not mess with the traffic. Uh, but my name's Nancy Howell. I'm one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon, and we've got a couple of other board members here as well. So, uh, and it is Tuesday, April 2nd. Next, me. And I also, I already welcomed everyone. And again, I hope your your spring birding is going to be good. Uh, I put up some pictures at the table uh, at the back on the display board and I picked a lot of spring migrants and things just to get us excited. Uh, I'll be mentioning World Migratory Bird Day as well as a couple of our Earth Day events uh, with which we need some, uh, some assistance, some volunteers. Uh, the Spring Bird Walk series will be starting soon. I also want to mention a couple of partnerships that uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon is working with and um, is the Trust for Public Land and the uh, Young uh, Ohio Young Birders Group. Um, of course, sign up for our e-newsletter if you haven't already and then becoming a member. So we'll go through those slides with that information. So next, please. So the World Migratory Bird Day is on the second Saturdays of, of May and October, which how, how convenient it coincides with the second Saturday bird walks we have. So we can really, really promote it at that time. And um, so really, and this, this year's uh, World Migratory Bird Day is not just protecting birds, but protecting insects. What a segue. <laughs> uh, uh, but because this evening, of course, we'll be talking, we'll have a talk about uh, bumblebees and pollinators, plus who knows what else will join us in the in the slide deck. But uh, insects, of course, feed not just adult birds and aerial insectivores, but so many young birds. So protecting uh, uh, insects will protect birds and allow them to raise their young uh, in your neighborhood, in your yard, in parks. Thank you. <laughs> Next. Uh, so our volunteer opportunities, uh, our sustainable Berea Earth Day event, I believe we have enough for that day. Yay, enough volunteers. Yay. We've got lots and lots going on. That is taking place. Uh, there's a bird walk at 830 that I'll be leading. And then uh, there's a little span of time when there's going to be a cleanup at Co Lake. And then the activities will start uh, at 11 o'clock and run until one o'clock. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, Parma Heights Earth Day, we uh, have a few folks and that'll be a lot of fun as well. Uh, it is at Greenbrier Commons and you can see it's only from one to four in the afternoon. Um, oh, the uh, Sustainable Berea Earth Day is in a, a pavilion, a shelter. Uh, the Parma Heights Earth Day is we provide our own tents. So uh, anybody who has signed up to volunteer, I will be communicating as a to um, you know, what to wear and that kind of stuff. And then Earth Fest 2024 on, on Saturday, May 11th uh, at the West Shore Unitarian Universalist Church. Um, there's, it runs from 10 to three, looks as though we'll need a few more volunteers for that as well. So I am the one to contact, uh, and it's very easy, Nancy Howell at wcautobahn.org. Next, please. So the Spring Bird Walk series, uh, in its 91st year, there are bird walks taking place in lots and lots of counties, not just Cuyahoga County, but Lake Geauga, Lorraine, Medina. Um, they are on the last three Saturday, uh, Sundays of April and the first three Sundays of May. And you can see the dates here. Uh, the one in Medina County is at River Sticks Park. And that takes place on the Saturdays preceding that those Sunday dates there. So uh, if you haven't been to River Sticks Park, great birding, great wildflowers. Oh, it's wonderful. And then for the entire uh, list of locations, again, please reach uh, out to our website and just click on the Spring Bird Walks. It's, they're all there. Next, please. So as I mentioned, the Trust for Public Land and Ohio Young Birders Club are two organizations that uh, Western Cuyahoga would really, really like to get much more involved with. 
getting people out. As you can see, what uh, TPL uh, creates parks and protects public land where they're needed most so that everyone, and we're talking about maybe communities that don't have access to green spaces as much as we're used to green spaces. Um, the, so you want to close the park equity gap. Uh, and at schools, they want to convert uh, the co concrete to vibrant schoolyards. So plantings and, and uh, you know, great uh, uh, exercise areas, uh, swing sets and things like that. And then Black Swamp Bird Observatory is the uh, organization that runs the Ohio Young Birders Clubs. And the Northeast Ohio chapter right now has one leader. And we could use a second leader, uh, someone who will be available to take young people out. And we also would like to encourage people to hand out flyers to maybe young people that you know. I have flyers at the back table. They are simply a, a card like this. And uh, if you know of maybe a young person, maybe those who are leading some bird walks for us, grab a little stack and hand them out and, and talk, uh, talk it up to folks because um, it's really, really good. And you can see they do field trips, but uh, service projects, uh, restorations, cleanups, all different kinds of things. So uh, really we want uh, to get more involved with helping the Ohio Young Bird. Next, please. Keep informed, again, our e-newsletter, uh, you can either take a picture of this slide or memorize it, right, uh, or become a member of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Next, please. All righty, Michelle Brocious, another one of our board members. All right. Thank you, Nancy. Hello, everybody. Um, oh, that was bright. All right. I'm going to be discussing the bird walks for April, as well as how you can connect with us on social media. And that right there is a common grackle that visited my feeder the other day um, with a genetic mutation causing that, that white eye ring, which was really cool. I thought I'd share it with all of you. All right, so, haha. -ha. So th this guy was on our, our last uh, second Saturday bird walk. Uh, we, we don't just look at birds, you know, all animals are welcome, right? And plant life too. Um, so our second Saturday bird walk is coming up on April 13th. At 9 a.m., we meet at the Rick, uh, Rocky River Nature Center um, parking lots between the upper and lower parking lots, and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Uh, Bill Dunninger, Dave Grass Kemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand are our leaders for that walk. Uh, so hope that we can see you uh, coming up soon. All right, so the May 2nd Saturday Bird Walk has a different location. We, you know, we've been running this bird walk for 30 plus years and it's always been, you know, we meet at the Nature Center. Well, in May, uh, the Cleveland Metro Parks has asked since they have a plant sale that we not park in the Nature Center parking lot because they want all those spots for, for their customers. So uh, we agreed and we will meet at the Frostville Museum. So still walking the same trails that we always walk just starting from a different place. So please, in May, Crossville Museum, don't meet us at the Nature Center. All right, and then um, we are having a joint field trip with Kirtland Bird Club at Florian Meadows, and that is on April 20th at 8 a.m. Um, we're gonna meet all the way back by the Katie Did Lodge, so at the end of the driveway is where we'll meet and I am leading that walk with Bob Opper. And please register if you want to attend this walk so that if there are any event updates, um, you're in the know. And then we have an afternoon bird walk the next day, April 21st at 3 p.m. And uh, we will be walking um, the Station Road Bridge Trailhead. The leader for that is Lynn Shaco, and also please register for that one as well. You, these registration links are available in our calendar and we send out emails. So even if you can't jot that link right down right now, um, you'll get it um, coming to your inbox if you register for our e-newsletters. And then uh, finally, the Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walk, fourth Saturday of each month. Um, this month it is on April 27th at 9 a.m. 
Uh, we meet at the Towpath Public Parking Lot on Abbey Avenue, and Nancy Howell and Al Rand are our leaders for that walk. And then finally, follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, X, which is formerly Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are recording our speaker series today. Uh, we record all of our online events, book clubs, and whatnot. So if you want to view those recordings, please subscribe so you won't miss one. All right, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle. Oh, again, always bird walks, bird walks, bird walks, bird walks, and, and seeing crayfish too. Uh, Marianne Romito can't be here this evening, but I was going to mention uh, the climate watch that she coordinates. So next slide, please. Some of you are uh, climate watch um, participants and uh, National Audubon uh, has a, a huge list of birds that are having some concerns with uh, the changing climate um, with habitat changes, especially. So this data that goes in will be long-term so that we can see if certain species are, are leaving the area, moving, not maybe not moving from the area, maybe doing better, who knows? Next. So, and this is what, uh, this is the time that we do our uh, spring climate watch surveys. It's between May 15th and June 15th. There's also a winter survey, so they want information both summer and winter. And what we survey in our area uh, are common species, American goldfinch, white-breasted nuthatch, uh, eastern towhee, and of course I'm going to forget the other two. Um, Oh yeah, Eastern Bluebird, and then there's one more. I think Red-Breasted Nuthatch is, is another one, yes. So um, if you know those birds by sight, by sound, or you can go out with somebody, again, Marianne Romito is the coordinator. You would need to contact her to get a little block or a square to cover. Next. Uh, so you can watch the YouTube video uh, the, on Climate Watch the, that uh, was Create, created by us here and um, uh, as a program. Marianne Romito's information, email and phone. The I say the sp Spring Climate Watch can take place anywhere between May 15th and June 15th. However, just to get it one and done, if most of us can go out one day, Saturday, June 1st, boom, it's done. If you're doing two surveys or two, two sets of surveys, of course, you can't do them both in one day, but do one one day and do it on another day. Some people have chosen to have two blocks that they can cover. So again, if you can go out on that June 1st, that would be great. Next. All right, Drina, Drina Nemes, our book club coordinator. Hi, everybody. Next slide, please. Well, just three weeks from tonight, we'll be uh, talking about the wonderful book, Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest by Suzanne Samard. And I found this graphic of British Columbia forests, and there are at least 14 different types of forests. And Susan is, Suzanne is so familiar with all of them. So it's, it's quite interesting. Next slide, please. Um, and what she says is, it's a personal and scientific work on trees, forests, and the author's profound discoveries of tree communication. I found a, a great YouTube video. It's a TED Talk that she gave, and it's called How Trees Talk to Each Other, and it's a good summary of her book. So if you can get a sense of what her research encompassed. And then Terry Gross, who always does great interviews, has a, a session with her. And then the book's available at the libraries in town. Next slide, please. And uh, this is our fourth year of our book discussions. And our previous book that we discussed, Festival Flights, is available at our site. And then also all our previous book discussions are available at the bottom. Uh, link there. Next slide, please. And then um, I always like to connect with David Lindo a little bit and his In Conservation with series. 
Um, he has two coming up next week. Um, the first one, it's called It's a Rat's Life. <laughs> so that should be of some interest. And then Normalizing the Urban Wildlife Experience. They're all very wonderful uh, interviews, very conversational. And so, and that's about it. Eudrina? <clears throat> Now, is Amanda going to be doing her uh, discussion um, here? Amanda, did you want to come off mute and share your slides, or do you want us to cover it here? Yep. I might be able to. So, um, thanks. Thanks. Well, um, I as I've said before, when you... Um, buy our bird friendly coffee uh you're supporting the mission of wcas as well as um helping farmers because they get uh at least closer to a living wage you also support the habitat of the birds that we love and um, um keep keep the rainforest from being clear cut so uh, we're going to be having another uh, order go in on April 10th. So if you're interested in drinking coffee that's going to support uh, the birds that we love and keep that rainforest intact, please consider ordering coffee from WCAS. Uh, usually we get it within a week and then I deliver the coffee to everyone. So um, as I said, order goes in soon, so please consider ordering. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. And I also want to add that at the back table are these coffee club cards, and that has information uh, as to you know how to get onto our homepage, plus uh, five reasons to always buy and drink bird-friendly coffee. Okay, um, so we hope that you can pick those up and hand them out to folks, too. Thanks, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Next. And another fundraiser is Tilth Soil that is produced by Rust Belt Riders. Uh, Tilth Soil is, is organic soil that is created by the Rust Belt Riders picking up the food scraps that uh, uh, restaurants and, uh, and the public uh, drop off. Um, I've used it. There are several varieties. You see sprout for sprouting seeds, grow, Bloom House, just right for house plants. Oh, and they added something new, Wendell, which is organic compost mulch. <laughs> um, but you can purchase, you can purchase the the soil and the compost uh, online. Um, and it's easy. First of all, you order, you pay via PayPal or credit card. And then we pick up the soil and deliver it to your home. Just as Amanda said, she gets the coffee, delivers it to your home. We get the soil, deliver it to your home. So um, it, again, it's very, very good stuff. And you can take a look at their website just to see uh, a little bit more about it. Next, please. And uh, next month, uh, Dr. Catherine Flynn uh, from Baldwin Wallace University will be talking about Northeast Ohio forests through time, how things have changed, well, since the native people were here, when the early settlers came in, and what we're doing right now. So hope that you can join us on Tuesday, May 7th, right here at the Fairview Park Library. But this evening, bumblebees. Essential Pollinators by Dr. Chris Pappas. Did you know that there is a veterinarian that takes care of bumblebees? <laughs> April Fools. No, <laughs> you do. Yes, you do. So we are so honored to have Dr. Pappas here. Um, and I have a little bit of information. Um, Dr. Pappas uh, is a veterinarian who owns West Geauga Veterinary Hospital in Chesterland. Uh, small animals, birds, and exotic pets, I didn't see bees up there on the list, are the main animals she treats, uh, and she's a, a wildlife rehabilitator. Uh, she's been a bastard gardener for Geauga County since 2012 and has taken additional training specializing in pollinators, native plants, and biodiversity. 
Since 2013, she's been involved in a group of master gardeners experimenting how to best grow milkweed at the reclaimed waste management landfill. Dr. Pappas designed and helps to maintain the butterfly garden at the Patterson Building in Burton, helps other, uh, others design pollinator gardens, and lectures on native mason bees, bumblebees, and gardening for wildlife. She is vice president of Perennial Gardeners of Chesterland and grows hundreds of native plants from seed for their annual plant sale. So this evening, let's welcome Dr. Pappas. Thank you. All right, thank you. It's going to take me just a second to get the presentation switched. While I'm doing this, I did forget to mention... How's this not... There we go. No? All right. Well, I did forget to mention that uh, we have 17 Zoomers. Does this say, like, close the presentation? This is going to be interesting. I have to do it from here. Boom. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we have 17 Zoomers with us, and they can only hear us if we speak into these mics. So um, at the end of the Q&A, if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll get a mic out to you so they can hear your question. Um, and likewise, Zoomers, you are hooked up to the speakers so we can hear you through the speakers loud and clear if you talk. So please uh, keep yourselves on mute. I'm trying to do a good job of that, um, but make sure you're on mute so that we don't have distracting background noise during the meeting. All right, thank you. That's not the start. That's not the start. <laughs> I wanted to put in a plug for till soil. Those hundreds of native plants, I use sprout. I love their soil. But nobody delivered it to me. I had to drive to Cleveland. Get it. <laughs> Great, thank you. So the title of this talk is The Buzz on Bumblebees, Essential Pollinators. Uh, everyone loves bees, but they only think honeybees. I like honeybees, but they are not native. And bumblebees can do something called buzz pollination. And we're going to talk about that. Next. It's okay. So this is true. I'm a bumblebee lover. I do pet them. They don't enjoy it. Um, I'm not afraid of them. I would never dig up their nest. They would not like that. But they're just busy out there on a cold, drizzly day. They'll still be out uh, collecting nectar and pollen way earlier than honeybees. They're big and bulky, so they can stay warm. They don't get buffeted about by wind and rain so much. Towards the end of the season, when the males have been kicked out of the nest and they're just sleeping in a tubular flower, I pet them. They give me a high five, but it, it isn't really a high five. It says, I'm annoyed. Stop it. I will try to stop. Next. So what makes a bee a bumblebee or bumbles, as we like to say? Well, they're bigger, they're fuzzier. Uh, if it has a shiny butt, a shiny hiney, it is a carpenter bee and not a bumblebee. So they always have fuzzy butts. Um, I say they're slow and friendly. Maybe it's anthropomorphizing, but they really don't care about me. They're just doing their thing. So when I'm out gardening or photographing flowers, they're right there with me. I have no fear of them. They are native. They're not domesticated like uh, honeybees are. A whole different genus called bombus. Um we're going to talk about buzz pollination, which other bees can't do. And unlike uh, a honeybee colony, which is perennial, goes over many years, they last less than a year. And only the mated queen overwinters all alone underground. Next. So why? Why should you, bird lovers, care about bumblebees? And why should you plant the native plants I want you to plant for the bumblebees? Because when there's biodiversity, um, all systems are more resistant to extinction. And as was already mentioned, the baby birds, 
six or 98 percent of all birds feed insects to raise their young, even if they are grain eaters as adults. So we also, a lot of us are gardeners. We want our crops uh, pollinated. We want better yields. We want colorful fruits and veggies. So we need bumblebees. They are an essential pollinator and they need our help. Next. So as I mentioned, it's a hedge against extinction. If you have 10 kinds of bumblebees and one goes extinct, you're probably as sad as that is, you're probably still all right. But if you lose, you have very few types or species and you lose one, a whole system can kind of collapse. Next. So 85% of plants are pollinated by animals, usually bees. The others are, as we know, wind pollinated or other creatures. And the bumblebees, they're out now. They're starting now, even when it's getting very cold at night. They just go back in their nests. And the birds that you love, in addition to needing the um, insects to feed their young, they are dining on the fruits and the seeds and the nuts and uh, using the trees for shelter. So the same thing that threatens bumblebees threaten the other ecosystems around and the health of our agricultural systems. Next. As I mentioned, birds need bumblebees because they need to eat all these delicious things. Next. So I don't want to, I could have a whole talk on what is native, but it would be very boring and we're not going to do that. So I'm just going to use my a definition that it's a plant that's co-evolved with the other plants and animals in the system and it's contributing. So it doesn't have to say it was here before the Europeans came or a thousand years or anything like that. It's a contributing member of the system. And you have to know your ecoregion. Uh, we're in the Eastern Temperate Forest Ecoregion 8 and that becomes important when you're looking up what is keystone plant for your area. Next. So where are their nests? Well, it's not really very glorious. They're abandoned mouse and chipmunk holes, maybe under the edge of a log. Um, sometimes they nest in odd places like a birdhouse that you put out for something else or a saddle, uh, a couch cushion that had a little tear in it. So uh, first time you sit down, uh, maybe check these things. They, they do not chew holes in wood. That's our shiny hiney, the carpenter bee, who is actually also a good pollinator, but I'm not going to try to make you love them tonight. Next. Um, look at this messy affair. I wonder if that's why I like bumblebees, because I'm a little messy too. We have all these little pots um, half filled with honey and something called bee bread, uh, but no extra honey for us. So you can't... Uh, raid their nests and and get honey. Next. Um, as I mentioned, they have an annual life cycle and that's really hard to imagine. But when the mated queen comes out, she's been overwintering, sitting on one of those little pots with some bee bread, very hungry. And she has to feed on the real early blooming spring ephemeral wildflowers or willow pollen. And then she'll have the uh, she'll have females that'll help her provision the nest, and by late summer or fall, it's a bigger affair where there's anywhere from a hundred to three hundred fifty. Um, the mated queens will fly off and separate, and they're the only ones that overwinter. Everyone else dies, so that's why we call it an annual cycle. And they're very vulnerable in the winter to environmental extremes, which is one of the worries we have with climate change. Um, you're expecting plants to bloom at a certain time. You're expecting winter to be a certain way. And at 60, it's 30. I mean, just think of this winter, how variable it's been. Next. Um, if you look closely at this picture, this bumblebee is in slow motion doing something called buzz pollination. He's grabbed on to the anther. He might even be biting one. He's disconnected the flight muscles, but vibrating those muscles. And he's producing a hum at the sound of middle C. And this pollen is just flying out of this 
I think it's a potato flower. There's a whole lot of flowers that are very stingy with pollen. They're called porocidal. They just want to shake out a couple little grains at a time. Bumblebees know how to get past that with their vigorous. Um, and they make a buzzy sound. I used to think they were angry. You know, you'd be walking by and you'd go, well, they don't care about me. They were getting pollen. I felt so stupid when I learned what they were doing. Next. This is a, hopefully a YouTube video that's going to have us here. I don't see the little dot. Oh, that's sad. But the middle C also, oh, I, we didn't get it. This is a, a tuning fork. I was going to pass it around. And if you hit it, put it up to your ear, you're going to hear the same frequency that they use. You have to hit it on something hard. And if you're musical and you like the Beatles, the Hey Jude, Hey Jude, that's middle C. And it's a different tone than the buzz they usually do. If we can't get it, we can move on. I'll just be very sad. Okay. Next. So honeybees can't do it. Uh, you can use a tuning fork or an electric toothbrush. Uh, uh, maybe you were growing orchids or something where... <laughs> But you wouldn't want to do that for a whole greenhouse. Okay, next. Um, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplants, raspberries, strawberries, cucumbers, squash, apple, and fruit trees. Anyone like to eat these things? Ah. So about 6 to 8% of all native flowers are stingy, perfect for bumblebee pollination. And some native plants can only be pollinated by bumblebees. So if we didn't have them... We wouldn't have those plants. Next. The flight of the bumblebee. They used to say it was aerodynamically impossible. Well, obviously it's not because they're flying around, but that's when people were trying to compare their manner of flight to how an airplane lifts. They don't flap these four wings up and down. They're doing kind of a crazy helicopter side by side motion, like 200 times a second and it makes little mini hurricanes underneath, and they fly. There's still a lot of mysteries in my mind, but this was the explanation that I got. Next. Well, we're not going to see this one either, but anyway, the, the four wings, they look like two because the two small ones are attached by little hooks. They don't have any scales on their wings, unlike uh, moths and butterflies, which I also love. Next. So you hear a lot, are they competing? Are honeybees and bumblebees friends? Oh, they're kind of neutral. Uh, they're definitely, uh, honey. bumblebees are no threat whatsoever to honeybees. Honeybees maybe are a little threat to them because their sheer numbers can outcompete for resources. Or they can spread certain viruses to bumblebees that they leave on the pollen as a vector. But bumblebees do have a lot more nectar choices because they're strong and burly. They can muscle their way into a gentian flower. Um, and their large body size is really good at cross-pollinating and picking up even more pollen. So on the whole, I say they're kind of neutral. And the same things that help bumblebees will help honeybees. Next. Here are some of these real picky picky plants such as the native monk's hood in the upper left corner the ladies tresses orchid on the upper right can only be pollinated by bumblebees and potatoes can only be bumble uh pollinated by bumblebees so i know you can buy seed potatoes but there'd be no genetic diversity if there weren't bumblebees you'd be stuck with one kind of potato none of this red and yellow and idaho Next. So that is, I didn't make that up. That's really how this bumblebee looked after he buzz pollinated. And he's going, she, excuse me, is going to very meticulously collect all that pollen into her little pockets on her legs, which are called corbiculae. Next. 
These are little pollen baskets with very stiff hairs where she's going to pack all that pollen. Males have no cobriculae. They just eat what they want. They don't, well, they contributed something. But after that, they, they don't do anything to help the hive. Cuckoo bees uh, don't have any baskets either. Next. So this is a picture of Matt Valencic took. Uh, pollen comes in many colors. Sometimes you can tell what flowers they've been nectaring on and collecting pollen from just by the colors. Next, bumblebee anatomy. They have no ears, but they can hear with their antenna. They can sense temperature, light. They can smell with their antenna. They can sense electrical fields. And this lets them know if a flower has already been visited because when bees visit a flower, they change the electrical charge. <clears throat> they, uh, When you're identifying them, a lot of the textbook number, the abdominal segments with a T, uh, for me, that was very confusing. I thought they were thoracic segments, but no, they're not. They uh, name them a lot for what dots they have on their thorax. They don't breathe through their mouth. They breathe through little spiracles on their side, little holes. They have five eyes, the two big ones you see and three little ones called ocelli. Next. Their tongues are very important. There are short tongue bumblebees, medium and long tongues. And that, the length of the tongue determines what flowers they can easily uh, visit. So right now in this picture, the tongue is not yet out. It's in its protected spot. It could either be 5.8 to 12 millimeters. So almost like double. And it matters if it's a queen, a worker, um, but this does decrease the competition for flowers because they're hitting different targets. Next. This was a really cool thing showing <laughs> the bumblebee tongue coming out of its protection and has little feathery ends that draw up the nectar. Had some pretty cool music too. Next. <laughs> um. This is another one of Matt's picture. It looks like that's the stinger, but remember that's not the stingy end. Can a male bumblebee sting you? No, because a stinger is a modified ovipositor and he's not laying any eggs. But anyway, that's just protection for the tongue. Next. So there is the tongue out. It's very stretchy. Females also have really strong cheeks because they have to chew up certain things to make their bee bread, which is pollen and nectar um, for their young. Next. There's a lot of gender differences. Size does matter, but the queen's larger than the males and much larger than the worker bees. I don't know who is counting antenna, but it's not something you're doing in the field. This is back in the lab. But females have one fewer segment on their antenna. As I mentioned, only the female has a stinger but the males have bigger eyes, the better to see you with, my dear, because that is his function, to find the female. Only the female has the pollen basket. Uh, males tend to have a lot more yellow, even like yellow mustaches. Um, flow flowers, males only care about nectar, not pollen. So they're just, they're going to choose to nectar on different flowers than the female who's after pollen for her young. Next. So the genetics are just cuckoo, which is why I put a cuckoo bird up there. It's called ha haplodiploidy. So the females are diploid, meaning they have two sets of chromosomes. She passes one on to every egg. So every worker is 75% related to her sister and 50% related to the queen. I have to cheat and look in this because as many times as I've read it, I don't 100% get it. The males are haploid. They only have one set of chromosomes and they develop from an unfertilized egg. So it's important to understand why it makes sense for the workers to slave away for the uh, queen instead of trying to have their own young. It does make them a little more vulnerable to population decline uh, when population numbers are low because there's a lot less genetic diversity with this system. It's one theory why the uh, rusty bumblebee could be endangered. Their numbers got so low. Next. 
So here's some of the most common Ohio bumblebees, the cast of characters. And one little cheat I have to say is if so you're with someone who knows nothing about insects and they say, what kind of bumblebee is that? It's a common Eastern because usually it is. So you can seem very smart if that was important to you, but it is the most common one you're going to see with the longest season. They're out now, could be November, early December. You're still going to be seeing some, but the brown belted, two spotted, golden northern, confusing, and it is very confusing. It can look about like anything. The half black, the black and gold, and the American are who I considered the top eight. Next. But identification is difficult. Males look different than females. Queens look different from workers. Depends on the time of year, the season, the geography. Sometimes it takes a microscope. So if you're trying to ID them, take pictures from all different angles before you submit it to iNaturalist or wherever you're trying to get help. Sometimes just knowing the time of year tells you what uh, possible species it is, and then you have fewer choices. But as I say, there's the cheat. Who do you say it is if you don't really know? Common Eastern, Bombus and Patience. Next. But there's a lot of help. The Ohio Bee Atlas is part of iNaturalist. There's a free download uh, for a book. This Bumblebees of Eastern United States is fantastic. Bumblebee Watch has an app with a lot of uh, information that I'm presenting. So uh, if you do go on iNaturalist, if you're really curious, you can look up by county and see uh, this is too small to really look at. But uh, the brown belted was the second most numerous, except in Ashtabula County, where the two spotted was. Somebody in Cuyahoga had a rusty patch sighting, or did they? I don't know. It was on there. Um, Cuyahoga and Ashtabula have the most species, <clears throat> and Geauga the least. Sad. I'm from Geauga County. But, uh, there were no American bumblebees at all seen in Geauga, and I don't think I have ever seen one. Next. So let's say you don't really want to ID, just sit back, watch the slides and change how you garden to help them. It's not that important to me that you know which ones are which. It's more important that you're changing how you garden to help all of them. And I do have this book up front for show and tell afterwards. Next. So Bombus and Patient, kind of a medium tongue. Look where, he, look where she lives, woodlands, grasslands, farmlands, wetlands, urban parks, gardens. Isn't that everywhere? Kind of is everywhere. She has an underground nest and the males patrol for mates. Next. Um, this is called multitasking. She's harvesting pollen. What else is she doing? They're mating. Look how small the drone is next to the queen. Um, but you call a reproductive female a gyne. In bumblebee world, she only mates with one male. In the honeybee world, the female mates with many, many males. The mated queen is the only one that overwinters. I still find that kind of sad and tragic, but that's nature's design. Next. Um, these kind of schematics are what you study when you try to figure out what bee is what. They're not I don't find them that wonderful, but there has to be some way to help you try to learn what's what. I do find it helpful to look at when they're abundant. Look how many parts of the year they're very abundant. That's most of the year. And they are already out, as I mentioned. Next. Um, a generous in feeding. That helps her be successful. Um, the drones have no corbicula. This is a picture of a drone. So if you look at his back leg, it's not packed with anything, is it? And well, he's not collecting pollen. He's just sucking nectar. Next. This is a little visual of where they're found. Ohio is certainly abundant. Next. Um, they are the one species of bumblebee that there is a being grown they're still wild, but they are being produced and shipped to greenhouses for hoop houses, uh, production of tomatoes. Uh, Box will have uh, 45 to 60 workers with one queen. 
live four to five weeks. It's great for the greenhouse, but sometimes they escape from the greenhouse and we're worried that it is transmitting some disease to the native population, even though bumblebees are native, but these are shipped across country, very stressed. But tomatoes sure are good, so. Next. Now this is, so I went from the most common to the least. Here's your endangered rusty patch. And there is a link to a free pocket guide to identifying them or trying to at xerxes.org slash bumblebees. Next. The rusty patch, half yellow belly, a rusty patch, except for the queen. So how are you going to identify the queen? She doesn't even have the rusty patch. It's very unfair. Next. Why are there so few? They like grasslands and prairies. How many prairies do you know in Ohio? A couple little tiny patches left. It's very fragmented. They're usually uh, right next to agricultural areas where there's uh, pesticides, herbicides used, lack of genetic diversity, roadside mowing, we don't really know, but keep looking. Next. So this is a comparison before 2006. See all the black dots? And the yellow are citizen science sightings since 2012. Still don't know if that Cuyahoga sighting was real. Next. Here's a rusty patch on a mountain mint, one of the very favorite pollinator plants. They do emerge very, very early, the females. And their patch, as opposed to the brown belt, it always has a bit of yellow. This picture shows that pretty well. Rusty, but then with a yellow edge. Next. Here's the brown belted. It might seem humorous to say they always appear well-groomed, but when bumblebees are flying, flying around, they're, they're moving so fast, you have to get kind of an overall image so this is a very meticulously groomed one. There are some others that look very rough, like they just rolled out of bed in a fraternity. And you'll, you'll see that when we get to some. She likes open farmland and fields, parks and gardens. She nests underground or, or at the surface. But a male was once sighted at the top of the Empire State Building looking for females. We don't know if he was successful. Next. So there's the schematic for the uh, brown belted. And the abundance is, is not as widespread throughout the whole year. Next. There's a brown belted queen. Here's the description of the T, the abdominal segments that you'll see written about in guides, the turga. Next. And there's her range. So she's out out west more, if you remember the common eastern, really was eastern. Next. Now, here's one I haven't seen personally either, but it's called the American. And uh, it's declining in numbers, but favors open farmlands and fields. It's much more aggressive in protecting its nest than most bumblebees. Most bumblebees, you'd have to actually like dig into it to have a problem but it nests in tall grass so maybe it has to be more protective because it's not underground next pretty long season there's the pattern dark wings and a long face next um dark dark wings January to December, I think it might even beat the common Eastern for a long season. Next. And a wide distribution, but still declining. Next. Here's the two spotted. And I always, well, originally I thought they were trying to talk about dark spots. They're actually talking about the yellow spots. So I wish it were called a two yellow spotted, and that would be easier to figure out. But its colony uh, ends much earlier than others, kind of midsummer. Next. So if you were out there 
uh, birding in October and you saw a bumblebee, would it be a two spotted? Probably not. They're all they're all hibernating. They're they're done. Next. So here is a two spot um, showing that these spots are not on the thorax. It's the yellow W W shape on the T two. And males are very variable just to help in the identification. Next. There's their range. It's more Eastern. Next. Oh, now this is one that you might be able to identify, right? Very yellow, very yellow. In open grasslands, farmlands, it's a beautiful bumblebee. But their nests are not so beautiful. Soft grass mixed with goose poop? <laughs> And the males often congregate outside the nest, searching for, for mates. Next, it's extremely hardworking. I believe they visit about 44 flowers a minute, something like that. They live very short lives. They just burn themselves out in four or five months. Next. Very, very yellow. So I, this is like the most yellow bumblebee you'll see if you're looking. Fierce defenders of the nest. They cover intruders with honey and then sting them to death. I don't think that means birders, though. You're okay. Next. Um, here's a golden northern bumblebee working on Baptisia, false indigo, and really loves clover. Can reach way down in the red clover to get the pollen. I should have mentioned that most bumblebees will nectar up to a mile. They have pretty good range. Next. Now here's one called Bombus perplexus or confusing bumblebee. He doesn't look so well groomed, does he? Kind of messy, very scruffy. The fur, <laughs> the fur is uneven. An underground nest. Next. Very perplexing. Their colors vary, their size. Of a very short season, April to September. Next. Kind of a different range. It goes way up into Canada. Next. So <laughs> I like this. <laughs> I can't help it. It was the, the bumblebee's confusing and the poor little owl looks confused. Next. So there's a drone with a yellow mustache. Remember how I said more males have a lot more yellow? Reminds me of that one Texas actor, the mustache. Next, um, here's a little tiny messy scruffy one called the half black, Bombus vegans. I always think of him like he looks homeless. <laughs> Just probably, maybe not funny, but... I think it's a little funny. Um, favors the woods and parks. Might spend its whole life in the woods. Next. Relatively short season. Generalist. Kind of half yellow. Next. And there she is probably fertilizing something like a blueberry. And even their queens are small especially like some of these plants I mentioned, penstemon, the milkweeds, asters, the thistles, eupatorium, spirea, nest both above and below ground. Next. Now this, we went from little to big and bold. This is a black and gold bumblebee, the largest one with the largest eye of all bumblebees. Emerges very late, mid-June. So a few are out. Early March, you're not going to be seeing a black and gold. Next. Look at those eyes. She has a yellow ring near the tip of her abdomen. Next. Is a distribution. Next. So what to plant? Try to have plants flowering for a long season from spring to late fall. Willow and plum is great. Uh, maple trees, crab apples, linden, red bud, um, native shrubs, deer villa is a native honeysuckle, raspberries, roses, viburnums, the spring 
Uh, ephemerals and spring flowers are great. They thrive in shady areas. Uh, sprinkle clover in your lawn. That can help them all. Next. Do you have a little patch of trees or woodland? They're vital for overwintering for the newly mated bumblebees. Leave the leaves. She could be nestling under the leaves. Um, and in the spring, she's going to feed on the flowers. And, you know, trees have a lot of insects, including aphids. And when there's aphids, there's honeydew. She'll feed on the honeydew. It's very important. And keep soft landings. Mulch is not a soft landing, but tree uh, leaves are, or native, uh, low-growing native plants. So you can help bumblebees a lot by leaving a little patch of woods on your property. Next. Bumblebee colors. She prefers purple, blue, or yellow flowers, kind of blind to the color red. But what creature loves red flowers? Hummingbirds. So as a little nature's like, oh, you guys don't have to compete about this. Um, it's good to have flowers with different depths of the flower to support different kinds of bumblebees who have different lengths of tongues. They prefer perennials because there's even more nectar in it. And they know best how to feed from native plants. It doesn't mean they won't feed on other plants, but they have co-evolved with them. So the nutrients are just right. And sometimes when you plant something that's called a native R or a cultivar, a native plant, something's been tweaked to make it more appealing to us, flower color or shape. But sometimes things have happened with the nectar where it's not as nutritious or the timing is off. So um, there's a center called Cuba Center and they study native R's to see if they're as good as the natives. Interesting. Next, how to find native plants for your zip code. Xerxes Society, again, has a good website. Uh, LBJ, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. You can search by bloom time, bloom color, and region and decide what you want to add to your yard. So I don't say people have to rip up all their non-native plants, but if one dies, put a native in. Inch your way into having 75% natives. Next, oh, near and dear to your heart. The Audubon has a native plant list. One minor problem, in my opinion, it, it, it does list what plants attract butterflies. There is some crossover, but it's not going to say, this is best for bumblebees. So you guys tweak that site. Get the, get the bees and bumblebees on there. Next, and uh, Doug Tallamy, you guys may have heard him speak or read many of his books. He talks about how to find uh, the best keystone plant for your eco region. Um, think about getting your property certified as a uh, certified wildlife habitat through National Wildlife. You can have advanced bird habitat. I have that at my business, advanced bird habitat. Next. Uh, I love this uh, slide, even though it's not beautiful, but it shows you how if you had these plants, you're covering the season and it shows the colors of the bloom when they bloom. And uh, so this is in a nutshell, pretty darn good for the Great Lakes region. Spotted geranium, showy beard tongue, lupine, butterfly weed, bee balm, field thistle. I didn't say Canada thistle. Narrow leaf mountain mint. Tall Blazing Star, Showy Goldenrod, Bottle Gentian, New England Aster. Next. Oh, look this up on YouTube, you guys. This is so cute. This bumblebee muscles its way into a blue gentian flower. No other critters are strong enough to get into that flower to get down to the nectar. Next. This is just a summary of bumblebee conservation and how you can help them by not cleaning up your garden too early, uh, leaving those uh, tall grasses bent over so the female bumblebee that overwintered still has protection. And it says when it's safest to mow, if you have some farmland, late fall and winter are the best time for mowing and put your mower deck to the highest. Next. So 
I'm not talking about worms, but the early bee butt gets the willow pollen. <laughs> now the willow tree doesn't need the bees. They're wind pollinated, but it anything that's wind pollinated has to have a huge abundance of pollen because it's just like throwing it out there in the air. And so bumblebees and bees and mason bees take advantage of this abundant pollen source. Next. Some more key plants. Uh, I don't want to read them. You can see them. Herbs are also helpful if you're into herb gardening. That's a penstemon that the uh, hummingbirds love them too, even though they're not red. Um, next. This is a photo of mats. Everything loves coneflower, purple coneflower, including the birds when it has the seeds. Next. So how to tend your garden. Don't be too neat. Leave down branches and ornamental grass. Um, don't use neonicotinoid insecticides if you can help it. It's systemic, meaning uh, it didn't just kill what was on the surface. It gets in the pollen and the nectar. And even if it's sublethal, it doesn't kill the bumblebee outright. They get like disoriented and, and lazy and forget how to get back to places. Um, don't try to have that perfect lawn. Violets and dandelions are great for bumblebees. Try to have a goal of reducing your grass footprint. Grass is a green desert, sorry, but enough to walk on, but we don't have to look at a, an acre of it and leave the leaves because they'll shelter underground nests as well as butterfly, larva, and beneficial insects. Next. So neonics are a no-no. Um, I believe they've been outlawed in Europe, but the most we got is a new bee warning label on the box. <clears throat> Even, and if a bee gets thirsty and uh, an ear of corn or a, a corn plant produces a little dewdrop of fluid, we call it guttation. So they drink that dewdrop, the poison from that, or if the aphid is feeding on the corn and produces honeydew and they drink that, that can kill the bumblebee too. And then they carry the nest, the pollen back to the nest and poison their young. Next. So I usually say grow extra plants instead of having to have one perfectly. Grow 10 and maybe there'll be two or three that are perfect enough for fair. You don't have to win every time. So try to leave 15 to 30% of your property in woods, leave the logs, plant natives at the edge of your wood for pollinators. That's how to manage your woods for bees. Next. Other dangers, I mentioned the commercially reared bumblebees. Climate change is changing, changing when bloom times are, reducing the foraging period. Think about when bloodroot comes out before the tree leaves are out. What if it's warmer and the tree leaves are out when the blood root comes out? It won't get any sunshine. So we're just messing with the timing of things, losing habitat, replacing with grass and concrete. Bumblebees are in trouble. Next. Oh, so more than one quarter are facing risk of extinction. We call them, fly I call them flying teddy bears. So do your part to slow climate change. Lose the lawn, leave the leaves. Nature will thank you for it. Next. Two of my favorite things and one of my favorite plants, button bush. Next. Um, I do have handouts for you folks that are here, but for those of you on Zoom or if you want to download it, uh, this is the code for the new Ohio State bumblebee plant by numbers. Not only goes over the life cycle, it gives you a garden layout with a list of plants and uh, many other resources too. Next. So bumblebees are actually big enough to activate your ring <laughs> system. So if a bumblebee knocks on your door, next. Let them in, and you're going to get better pollination and higher yields. Next. So is this the end, or is it just the beginning? 
next. So here's some of the resources. So many of the photos were from Heather Holmes, who is uh, a photographer and book writer. Uh, wonderful information on growing native plants for different pollinators. Ohio State has a, a nice card, Common Bees of Ohio, you can download. ODNR has a really good book, uh, many good books that are all free. This is Common Bees and Wasps of Ohio. I like wasps, but I don't love them like I do bumblebees, but many are excellent pollinators and quite beautiful. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, again, remember, if you have a question, um, raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone to you. Um, oh, here, somebody mm -hmm. back there. You're getting your steps in. Yep. Just curious about how the bumblebees seem to like the hostas. We just moved into a place and mm -hmm. we're surrounded on all sides. Oh, yes. Bumblebees adore hosta flowers. <laughs> so don't cut them off for neatness. Let them bloom. Hummingbirds and uh, bumblebees. So hosta are not native, but I, I have them, about 300 of them, and I like them too. <laughs> Any questions on uh, via our Zoomers? No questions? All right. I noticed on your um, populations of the month wise, some of them were in January and December. I mean, what what do they do? Where do they go? What what do they eat? Hmm. Well, some of those probably were the mated queen that was underground, and it was just a, a really warm day, and maybe there was still a mum hanging on, or something like that. Now, do do the queens also go out and feed, or do they stay in the hive or whatever it is at the, all at summer? At the beginning of the year, she has to do it all. She has to go and provision the nests until she has raised enough workers. And then she can take it a little easy and stay in there and lay more eggs. So every one of those little cups had bee bread and a single egg on it that was going to turn into a worker bee. And she doesn't produce the um, the drones or the um, females are going to become the gynes or mated queen until late summer, early fall. So she has to work really hard at the beginning. Are, are those like, do they overwinter then or does she just produce them in the spring? Only one, only one mated queen survives. Right. The original queen dies, all workers, all drones die. So in the spring, the one mated queen arises and starts it all over again, but only for that year. Okay. How it's does hard... she get pregnant? Or... I mean, they, she... they mated uh, uh, at the, in late fall. Okay. Okay. And then the drones were sitting in the turtle head or whatnot where I could pet them. How do you pet a bee? Uh, well, I mean, well, you when, just have to get right in there. Or... Yeah, when they're nectaring, they're very busy. They don't care. Okay. I, just, I stay at the fuzzy butt area. And when they're in the morning, they're very cold usually. And they there's a very, not a very uh, vigorous complaint. It's like, <laughs> all right, I guess there's a question via Zoom. Thank you. Um, Becky asks, I have two small mason bee houses. Should I take them down and clean them or leave them? <clears throat> there. Well, they should have been take, taken down and cleaned. It's probably too late. The, the mason bees are already out. So if you, if you don't replace it, you tend to get um, an increase in parasites and a lower... Uh, you, they lose a lot more of the young. So mason bees are very early, just like um, the bumblebees come out and they're already um, nectaring and, and getting pollen from the spring flowers and the willow trees. So, but I have a whole other talk on mason bees. And there's a lot of good information on the Xerxes Society specific to that. 
how to be a good steward for mason bees. You can also use native stems. Um, if you had a cup plant or an elderberry or uh, raspberries, um, you, you leave the stems um, and then the native mason bees will use that as well as um, other leaf cutter bees. And instead of packing the pollen on the legs, like the corbiculae, they have it on the underside of their belly is very furry. So they have pollen all underside and they look like flying Cheetos. Those are mason bees or leaf cutter bees. I have a lot of stemmed plants on my property mm -hmm. and uh, I leave them over the winter. When is it safe to start cutting them back without ru ruining it for the bees? Right. Well, if you are around an orchard where there are apple or pears, when those flowers fall out is, is a good time. Because um, every year it's a different time. So I can't just say, wait till May, because that isn't how phenology is or how every year is different. So if you watch what else is going on in nature, so when the apple trees are done flowering and the flowers fall, it's safe. If you have to, because you're in a, a development and your neighbors are, anyway, you can uh, cut it down to two feet even now, but leave the other branches there on their side. But native plants develop to have nobody cutting down the branches. So, and it's nice. You don't have to work so hard if you get away with it. It's helpful to have a, like a sign, native plants, or protecting the bees. And then people don't just think, oh, they're lazy. They know we're doing things for a reason. All righty. I don't think there's any other questions. Um, I want to thank Dr. Pappas. How about if we give her a nice round of applause? Thank you. And again, there's literature here. If you'd like to come and talk one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Pappas, um, that would be lovely. Um, maybe get some of your questions answered that she didn't answer or didn't have time to. For shy people. <laughs> For shy, yeah, right, exactly. Uh, but that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Uh, the welcome. birds and the bees, that's what we're all about, right? <laughs> Multitask, <laughs> yes. Thank you again. And uh, for folks, remember, pick up things, literature at the back table if you're going to be leaving right away. Um, thank you. <laughs>